What's up, Porch? How we doing tonight? Hey, my name is Timothy Atik, and I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Watermark Community Church. It is so great to get to be here with you tonight. Definitely want to give a shout out to the Porch Live locations of Indianapolis, Boise, and Fort Worth, Texas. Hope that all is well with you guys. It's good to be right here with those in Dallas. We are continuing the His and Hers series. I want to start just by sharing with you uh, that my wife and I, we got married on October 14th, 2006, which means we are old people. But we had an incredible wedding, and we had an incredible first year of marriage. The beauty of getting married is that you get to invite all of your friends, and they are required to bring you a gift. Not only that, you get to tell them what they have to buy you. You register, and they're obligated. And it's a great thing. And so a bunch of people gathered in Wichita Falls, Texas, for our wedding. And uh, I'm half Palestinian, which means we had a Middle Eastern flair to our wedding. So if you've ever seen uh, movies or videos of Middle Eastern weddings with people like flying in the air in chairs, that was us. Catherine and I were in chairs, in the air, The Arabs of the wedding circled up. My cousin magically appeared with the drum. He was playing the drum. We were circled up. It was dancing. It was great. My wife's little sister, who was in high school at the time, brought her high school friends, and they all left saying, I want to marry an Egyptian. I'm not Egyptian. (laughs) I hope that worked out for him. But that's how good our wedding was. And then after we got married, we went to St. Lucia for a honeymoon, which was amazing. And then we just played really hard for our first year. We went to Puerto Rico, in Italy, in California, in Florida. And we played so hard that we we gained the marriage 15. If you remember the freshman 15 from college where you eat so much that you gain 15 pounds. Well, when I applied for life insurance during our first year of marriage, I had to check the box for excessive weight gain because our first year of marriage was that, that good. And even to this day, we just celebrated our 16-year anniversary. I love marriage. I love being married. I have a great wife. Catherine is amazing. But here's what I haven't told you. I haven't told you about the time that my wife threw a blanket at me because she was so mad in our first fight about where we were going to spend the holidays. That was a huge issue in our house. I haven't told you about the fight that we had in public in the Austin airport as we were flying to San Diego for our one year anniversary. Like I haven't told you about those times because when you who are single, which is the majority of you in this room or you're dating, when you think about marriage and statistics would say that marriage is important to about 80 to 90% of you in the room. When you think about marriage, most likely you only think about the good times. Like, does anyone here dream about fighting with your future spouse? Any girl's like, I just can't wait to fight with him. It's going to be amazing. No one, no one dreams of that day. Anyone longing to get into marriage and then wish that you were no longer married? Anyone think about that? Anyone dream about a day when you could feel stuck in your marriage? Or that you could be married and feel lonely? No, we don't think about that. And so that's one of the reasons that we're doing this series, His and Hers. Because the reality is, it is it's easy to find the wrong dating relationship that leads to the wrong marriage. Our hope is that you'd find the right dating relationship that would lead to the right marriage. And so the first week of this series, David just talked about uh, three signs that you're not ready to date. And then last week he gave us 10 keys to uncomplicating dating. Tonight, what I want to do is I want to give you six questions that will hopefully save your marriage before it ever begins. That's my hope tonight. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to join me in the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs, chapter 1. As you're turning there, if you're like, I don't know what he just said, okay? The Song of Songs is a book in the middle of of the Old Testament of your Bible, don't be afraid to use the table of contents. And the reason that we're turning there tonight is that Song of Solomon is basically God's instruction manual for romantic love. It is all about finding love, making love, and maintaining love. It gives us God's design 
for relationships between men and women. And so if there's any place that we should look, we should look to the Song of Solomon because God hasn't just uh, tossed us marriage and said, figure it out. No, he actually gives us an instruction manual for it. Now, I want to be clear, tonight isn't just a talk about marriage. So if you are single, this talk is especially for you. If you are dating, this talk is for you. If you are engaged, this talk is for you. I want to give you six questions from the Song of Solomon that will save your marriage before it begins. If you're looking with me at the Song of Solomon, we're going to start in chapter 1, verse 1. Now, if you've never read the book before, what you need to know is that it is God's ideal for love. And so you see a man and a woman just journeying through life together. And so you see them in different phases of their relationship. You see them before marriage. You see them getting married. You get to be a creeper in the honeymoon suite when they have sex on their first night of marriage. You see them into marriage fighting. You see them having sex many years into marriage. It's that kind of book. Like God put that in he put it in the Bible. So just watch how it starts out. Verse 1, chapter 1. It's the girl and guy talking back and forth to each other. I'm going to just tell you, the girl talks more than the guy. Like the Bible gets us. That's just the way it is. It's science. Okay, here we go. Verse 1, it says, the song of songs, which is Solomon's. The song of songs, that's, that's a superlative. It's like saying that Jesus is the Lord of all lords. Solomon was a songwriter. He wrote over a thousand songs. When it says the song of songs, it's saying that this is his greatest hit. The song of songs, which is Solomon's. Watch verse two. This is a girl talking. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. This is the Bible, people. This is, this is the way this book goes. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is better than wine. Now watch this, verse three. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. The first question that I want to encourage you to ask that will save your marriage before it begins is this. How do you both smell? Okay, you didn't see that coming, did you? Some of you are like, I just came from the gym. I already feel like a failure. Like, that's okay. But the first question is, how do you both smell? That's a question that you should ask when you start dating someone, but you should ask that question individually about yourself right now. If you're single, how do you smell? Where am I getting that from? Well, did you see what he, she said? She said, your anointing oils are fragrant. What you need to know is in the ancient Near East, when the Song of Solomon was written, they didn't have water on tap. Taking a shower every day, it wasn't a thing. And so men would mask their natural musk by using oils and fragrances. Some of you guys are like, the Bible has never made more sense to me than right now. Because you're like the two people still using Axe body spray. And you've believed the lie that Axe is a shower replacement instead of a shower enhancement. Okay? 2009 called and they want their body spray back. But... <laughs> The reality is she's saying, look, this guy, he looks good and he smells good. But then she turns the corner and what does she say? She says, your name. And in the Hebrew, when that word name is used, it's a reference to character. It's a reference to his entire being. So she's saying, your entire being is oil poured out. So she switches from the physical smell of his body to the metaphorical smell of his being or his character. She's saying, you smell good inside and out. So it's just good to ask the question, like, when your name is mentioned, what fragrance is in the air? Like, if, if someone mentioned your name, would you be proud for that name to be associated with you? Wait, that didn't make sense. Let me run that back. Okay, rewind. If your name is mentioned, Will people be proud that you are dating their friend? So like what fragrance is in the air when your name is mentioned? Some of you are like, man, that makes me feel like a failure because I have a, I have a tough past. Hey, I just want to be clear from the start. Jesus Christ is in the business of giving clean starts to messy lives. So do not, you are not defined by your past. And at the same time, I'm just talking about right now where you're at. 
How do you smell? Let me give you a vision for what you want, okay? Uh, I've got three crazy boys, Noah, Andrew, and Jake. Noah, my oldest, who's 13 now, he was the first grandchild on either side of our families, which means he got more attention than any other grandkid has gotten. At the first Christmas, I rarely got to hold my own son because he was always being held by one of his grandparents. And so the rare occasions that I did get to hold Noah, after two seconds of holding him, I would get this whiff of old lady perfume because it, it was clear that he had been spending time with either Tata or Nana. That's what you want. When you get around someone, it should only take a couple seconds before you get a whiff of Jesus in their lives. And when someone gets around you, it shouldn't take long before they begin to smell Jesus in your life. Well, how do you smell like Jesus? Well, smelling like Jesus is what naturally happens when a guy or a girl surrenders their life to Jesus Christ. You come to a place where you recognize that Jesus Christ is Savior of the world and he is actually king and he's a good king. What do kings do? They rule. And so you've come to a place in your life where you just have realized, I want Jesus Christ to be in charge. I want him to rule in my life. And when you know Jesus, you know what happens. The Spirit of God comes and lives inside of you. And as you surrender each day to the Spirit at work in you, the Spirit of God begins to shape you into Christ-likeness. And as you begin to look more like Jesus, you begin to naturally smell like Jesus. This is what happens when you surrender to God. This is what happens when the Spirit is at work in your life. This is what happens when an individual begins to read the Word of God. Because you can't know God's Word without knowing His, you can't know God's ways without knowing His Word. So when you take this Word to heart, when you get connected with other believers, and you live in open, honest relationships with one another, and people begin to encourage you, you know what happens is you begin to smell as if you've been around Jesus. That is what you want. Our tendency is to minimize the importance of someone recognizing Jesus as Lord. If we're not careful, we'll make God just a box to check when it comes to dating. So it's like, well, I think I saw him at the porch. We went on a date and she, she mentioned church, so I'm sure that they're good, so check on that. Uh, do we like laughing together? I think we like the same music. We're both really ambitious, so I think that we're good. No, let's be clear. I'm gonna tell you what my good friend Greg Mott told me. There's a huge difference between a Christian boy and a godly man. There's a big difference between a Christian girl and a godly woman. Okay, godly men and godly women smell as if they've been around Jesus. So let me ask you just some very specific questions, okay? If you want to know if you smell like Jesus, then answer this question. Do you right now smell more of conviction or compromise? What do those words mean? What I mean by conviction is I mean you care more about God's ways than other people's opinions. And when I talk about compromise, I'm talking about settling for less than God's standards for you. So do you smell more of conviction or compromise? Does the person that you're interested in or the person that you're dating or the person that you're engaged to, do they smell of conviction or compromise? So just think about this. It's easy to smell like Jesus on a Tuesday night. And it's easy to smell like Jesus on a Sunday morning. But how does he or she smell on Thursday, Friday, Saturday night? How does she smell at happy hour with coworkers? Okay, if he will make you babysit him when he is drunk, when else will you have to babysit him? Okay, if, if he or she will cuss around you, they'll probably cuss around your kids. If he or she will cheat at work, that means that they're fine cheating. How are they, how do they interact with people of the opposite sex? If they're known as a player, what makes you think they're not playing you? So you just want to ask the question, do they smell more of conviction or compromise? 
do you smell more of conviction or compromise? If you're sitting there saying, I kind of feel like I smell of compromise, you know what? Jesus can freshen you up really quickly. He's that good. He loves you. And he can pull you in close. And he can go to work. And he can do a great work in your life. I'll ask you, I'll ask you this. Not just do you smell of conviction or compromise, but this. Do you smell of faithfulness or flakiness? Okay, does he or she smell of faithfulness or flakiness? I remember when, when my wife Kat and I, when we started dating, I was just so impressed by her because she was a faithful person. So she, she was a sales rep at IBM and all of her coworkers loved her because she was a faithful friend at work. But then on the weekends, she was invested in her church. I still remember pulling up and, and seeing her sit with a small group of high school girls that she was investing her life in, teaching them the Bible, because she was faithfully serving her church and investing in the next generation. And then I began to meet Catherine's friends, because that's the deal, guys. If you want to get with a girl, you got to get with her friends. And so when I began, that's according to the Spice Girls anyway, but um, when I began to meet her friends, here's what was so surprising to me. All of Catherine's friends considered Kat their best friend. And I was like, that's so amazing. Like there are multiple girls who look at you as their best friend. Why is that? She's a faithful friend. There is no drama about her. Like Catherine exudes joy. You just get around her and you feel better about life. She's a faithful friend. And so I just think about that, and I'm like, that, that's what you want. You want to be a faithful person, not a flaky person. So can people count on you to do what you say that you are going to do? Are you where you say you are going to be? Do you follow through? Does drama follow you around? Okay? We want to be people who smell as if we have been around Jesus. So here's just a good rule to live by if you're single. Become the person that you want to marry. Like whoever you're, you want to marry, whatever you want them to be like, if you want them to, to reek of Jesus, then become the person that you want to marry. Because you know what? If you want to marry a godly woman, well, you know what? Godly women are attracted to godliness. So surrender your life to Jesus. Here's the second question that I believe will save your marriage before it begins. Do you have the right people in your life? Okay, do you have the right people in your life? So now we're skipping ahead in the book. We're gonna, we're gonna look at different sections of the entire book. So now we're skipping ahead a few verses to verse nine. We just saw the girl speak. Now the guy is speaking and look at what he says. Verse 9, he says, I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Baby, you're a horse. That's what he just said. Guys, don't use it. It's not going to work. <laughs> Verse 10, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. Now, this is interesting because in verse 11, the girl's friends chime in. Anytime there's a guy and girl dating, there's always a group of the girl's friends nearby. And so they chime in and look at what they say. They say, we will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. So here, here's this group of friends that are looking at their, their girl friends saying, hey, we want to make you more beautiful for this man. Okay, uh, guys, I want to let you in on something. I worked with college students at Texas A&M University for five and a half years. And here's what I learned for five and a half years, okay? Um, guys, here's what you need to know happens when you call a girl up and ask her out. I'm not talking about meeting her on a dating app. I know a lot of people meet these days through a dating app, but I'm, I'm talking if you do the old-fashioned way in college and you call a girl up and ask her out, guys, I just want you to know if you did that in your past, what happened, okay? When y'all hung, hung up the phone, this is what that girl did, okay? I'm telling you, this is just reality. I'm educating you now. She got off the phone, and here's exactly what she did. She went, ladies, assemble! <laughs> and it doesn't matter where she was on the planet at the time. It doesn't matter where her best 
girlfriends were on the planet. Somehow they magically appeared in 30 seconds. They were all right there. And she informed them that you asked her out. And then one of them took charge and asked the question. Not a question, the question. What was the question? What are you going to wear? <laughs> and then she gave the response. I don't really have anything. <laughs> and that's all those girls needed to hear. They're like, we got you. So you need to know, guys, when she opened that door, she didn't own a thing that she was wearing. <laughs> Am I wrong? She didn't own a thing of it. But that's a really amazing thing because what you see is, is, is you see these girls that were like, hey, we are committed to you. We want to make you as beautiful as possible for this guy who's going to come and pick you up. You know what's even better? When there's a group of girls who have, who have a vision for how to just bring out Jesus in their friends. And now I'm not just talking about girls, I'm talking about guys as well. Like the best thing for you is to have a group of girls if you're a girl, a group of guys if you're a guy who are committed to making you more like Jesus. That they, would, they are committed to seeing the character of Jesus come out in your life. And so the question that I'm asking is, is do you have the right people in your life? Because here's the reality. Like if, if you have a roommate right now, and even if you don't have a roommate, whoever your closest friends are, if they are single and they end up getting married one day, they will be someone else's lifelong roommate. So you can actually play a part in helping them become the best lifelong roommate possible. Like, do you have some people in your life who, who are not afraid to wound you by telling you the truth? The author of Proverbs says that the wounds of a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, look, uh, those who really love you aren't afraid to wound you by saying the truth. But you know what your enemy does? Your enemy just tells you what you want to hear. So do you have someone in your life that is close enough to you that could say, hey, you know what? There are times where I feel like I have to walk on eggshells around you. You know what they're saying? They're saying, you're kind of moody. That's good for you to know. Hey, when you're frustrated with me, you shut me out. Like you, you stop talking to me. You don't respond to me for days. And then when we get back together and hang out, you act as if nothing happened. That kind of feels like something that should be addressed. I, I don't think you ever have said the words, I'm sorry. And, and so I just want to encourage you that that probably isn't the healthiest thing. Or you know, there's times where I hear you talk and, and, and I know the truth and you're exaggerating the truth. And I just want to encourage you to be a man or a woman of your word. Hey, is, how's your time with the Lord going? Are you experiencing consistency? If not, let's, Let's help one another out. Do you have those people in your life? Let me just give you a vision for what you want on your wedding day. When you stand on that altar, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to look to your right or your left at either your groomsmen or your bridesmaids. And what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to look at each guy or each girl and know exactly why they're on that stage. Because God used them in your life to make you more like Jesus. So when I stood on that altar in Wichita Falls, I had 13 groomsmen. You're like, that's a brag, man. Like you, you clearly have a bunch of friends. No, it's because my wife has a bunch of friends and she had 13 bridesmaids. So I was like, I got my yard guy there. I got, I got the RA in my dorm from years ago. I was like, man, come on. I, what's your name again? You'll work, you know. But when I stood on that stage and I looked down that line, I could look and say, you know what? God used these guys in my worst moments. When I was at rock bottom, at the height of my compromise in life, God used them to pick me up and restore me and help me get back on the path with Jesus. You know what? God used this guy to teach me the word of God. So I began to develop a love for the scriptures. You know what? This person helped me uh, enter into healthy conflict resolution. That's what, you, that's what you want. 
Do you have the right people in your life? Here's the third question that'll save your marriage before it begins. Do you know the difference between spring and winter? Do you know the difference between spring and winter? Skipping ahead now to chapter 2, okay? Verse 10. So the context here is that the guy comes to visit his girl. He's come from out of town, and he is inviting her out of the house to take a walk with him. Verse 10. The woman's speaking and she says, my beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs. The vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away away with me. Do you see what he's talking about? So he's inviting her to take a walk with him. And what does he start describing? He starts describing springtime. I mean, he talks about turtle doves. He talks about figs. And he's talking about things in blossom. He's talking about the time of year, the season where things are in bloom, that life is visible on the earth. And he's using springtime as a picture for their relationship. He's saying it's springtime outside and it's springtime in our relationship. You know that time of year, like right after winter in Texas, it's like that one day in March where it's sunny and 75 with a slight breeze and it's like the day before it starts feeling like you're standing in front of a blowtorch. You know what I'm talking about? It's like that one, it's that one day and, and like you walk outside and the breeze hits you and you involuntarily like close your eyes and just stop for a moment. Because everything feels right for that moment. That's what he's talking about. He's saying it's springtime in our, in our relationship. And so the question is, do you know the difference between winter and spring? What's winter? Winter is the time when everything goes dormant or everything dies, and there's no signs of life. When Catherine and I started dating, we dated for eight and a half months, and then we got married within 12 and a half months of our first date. And I would just say that our relationship, it, it felt like spring. It wasn't perfect. Like, you need to know, we had conflict, okay? Conflict is a part of every relationship. If there's no conflict, that's the problem. Like, if you have no issues, that's your issue is because you're ignoring the issues. So conflict is a part of every relationship. Conflict is actually an opportunity to glorify God. But our relationship, it, it felt like spring. It wasn't perfect, but it wasn't complicated. There was, there was no on again, off again. There was no really difficult conversations of like, what are we and is this really happening? And, and where are we at with all of this? We knew what we wanted. Like, we were both headed towards marriage. That's why we got into the relationship. We both were following Jesus. We both wanted to follow Jesus individually, and we wanted to follow him collectively. We were on the same page. We were headed in the same direction. It felt like spring. And yet, I, don't, I know what it's like to, to be in relationships that feel more like winter. Like, I've, I've been in relationships that really had, looking back, no signs of life. Like I've been in the relationships where it's on again, off again, and it's just, it's just so difficult because you never know where you're at. So it's like, are, are we on or are we off? Like we're mad at each other, we're mad at each other, now we're not mad at each other. Now we're mad in love with each other, now we're not mad in love with each other. And there's hours and hours of conversation trying to figure out what we are and what we're not, and are we going to do this, are we not going to do this? It's winter. I've been in relationships where things got really physical really fast, so there was guilt and shame. Because that side of marriage, there were certain things that we didn't want to do that we ended up doing. And so it just, it felt like, it felt like winter because guilt and shame was just constantly sucking out any of the joy of our relationship. And because we got so physical so fast, we never really got to know on each other, know each other because we just spent all of our time doing physical stuff. 
And so it kept us in the relationship a lot longer than we should have ever been in it. Because in the end, that relationship, even though it was a great person, just wasn't the right relationship. It was winner. I've been in a relationship there where there's a lot of insecurity. Like I still remember I was in this relationship where uh, I was so nervous that this girl was going to break up with me because she told me she didn't know if she wanted to keep dating because she didn't know if she liked how I looked. And I just remember like feeling so anxious about it. I look back now, I'm like, that was winter. That was winter. Like if you want to know if you're in winter, it's when a girl's like, I don't know if I like how you look, so I'll get back to you. Winter. Were those relationships fun? Sure. Did we make memories? Yes. Did it provide companionship? Absolutely. Yet, all the drama, all the insecurity, all the back and forth, all the tough conversations, all the guilt choked out the joy. It was winter. Now you're like, so you're telling me that relationships always have to feel like spring? No. Every relationship has different seasons. And so just so you know, there are going to be some days that feel like winter in relationships. There are going to be some weeks in marriage that feel like winter. But it is not winter all year long anywhere in this world that you want to live. Period. It is not winter all year long anywhere that you want to be. And the same is true when it comes to romantic relationships. If the winter in your relationship, if the winter inside your relationship is lasting longer than the winter outside, there's probably very little signs of life. And so this is me just stepping in. You guys don't know me. I mean, I'm not around here much, but this is just me coming in saying, look, if it's winter in a relationship for an extended period of time, it's not just going to magically turn to spring if you get married. It will only get colder. I promise you. And so some of you guys just need to hear me say tonight, it might be time to have a tough conversation and go your separate ways. Why? Because in the end, it's not the right relationship. Now, the reality is, I know what it's like to be in a relationship that you're scared to get out of. And the reason that you're scared to get out of it is because you just can't envision your life without that person in it. But just because you can't envision your life without that person in it doesn't mean God can't envision your life without that person in it. He's trustworthy. He's a good king. Will you follow him? Next question that would hopefully save your marriage before it begins is this, what is shaping your expectations of sex? Skip over to chapter four, just real quick. I just wanna highlight this real quick. But look at the wording, it says, behold, he's, it's the guy talking. Behold, you're beautiful, my love. Behold, you're beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Uh, put that one away, guys, and never bring it out. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from their washing. That's my favorite verse. Because he's basically saying, uh, I love your teeth because you have all of them. <laughs> your lips, verse 3, are like a scarlet thread and your mouth is lovely. He's just working his way down the woman's body. This is on their wedding night. And I love it because he's moving slowly. Verse four, your neck is like the tower of David built in rows of stone. Who says that? On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. He's talking about her necklace. Verse five, your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that gaze among the lilies. I wonder, I just picture this girl like, shut up already, like, <laughs> please. But what I love is that he's moving slowly and he's communicating. Most guys, when it comes, when you're in the moment having sex, you can't even put a sentence together. And here's this guy, he is communicating clearly. I love that. And he's moving slowly. Verse nine, you have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. 
You've captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Like he is, they are moving towards sex and you know what he does? He just stops to affirm her more. Which is amazing. Because most likely this is this girl's first time to be naked in front of a man or ever touched in a sexual way by a man. And so how is he operating slowly, safely, and selflessly. So a good question to ask is, is what is shaping your expectations of sex? And I would imagine that for many of us, it's pornography. Like statistics would show that, that for many of us, even though we know sex isn't reality, we still treat, even though we know porn is not reality, porn still acts like sex ed for many of us. So uh, the Barna Group did a study and they found that among young adults, 57% of young adults seek porn out at least once a month. So in this room, 57% of you most likely seek porn out once a month. I remember watching an interview with Channing Tatum and the interviewer said, hey, do you ever look at porn? He's like, yeah. They said, have you looked at porn in the last six months? He's like, yeah. Last six weeks? Yeah. Last six days? Yeah. Last six hours, he's like, what time is it? And it's kind of like, it was meant to be funny, lighthearted. Why? Because porn has just become normalized in our society. Pornography was a part of my story. For seven years, it was a part of my journey. And you know what it has done is it is, it's hijacked, it hijacked my understanding of sex. And, and so I even carried that into marriage, not the struggle with pornography because God freed me from it, the act of it prior to marriage, but what I brought into marriage was a tendency to try and pornify my marriage. See, that's what you'll do, is because what pornography will do is it will hijack your expectations for sex. But what you have to understand is that pornography, it's, if it's shaping your understanding this is where I'm trying to save your marriage before it begins. Studies have observed a correlation between men's porn usage and greater sexual dissatisfaction with their significant other in the form of sexual boredom or disappointment. So if you bring porn into your marriage, men, there's a high likelihood that you will experience disappointment or boredom with your spouse because she is not who you watch in pornographic films. But the same can go for women, ladies. Like, pornography isn't just a guy problem, it's a people problem. And statistics would show that, that women struggle with porn just as much as guys do. Another study demonstrated that a man's porn use can cause a woman to be more self-conscious about her body and sexual performance and thus lead to a decrease in attraction and desire for intimacy in the woman. So men, if you bring porn into your marriage, and I'll flip it, women, if you bring porn into your marriage, you know what it can do? It, it can cause insecurity in your spouse, and it can decrease their attraction to you or their desire to be with you. Another study found that over an extended period of time, if there's porn use in the marriage, that the probability of divorce doubles. And so I just tell you that to say, look, some of y'all are like, well, I've already blown it. Like, I've been looking at porn for years. Hey, remember the power of Jesus Christ, that he gives new starts to messy lives, and it is never too late to step into obedience. And God can do a great work in your life, and you can have a great marriage that is preceded by a, an extended season of purity, and that will be a blessing to your spouse. Next question quickly is this, do you know what love is? Do you know what love is? You look at Song of Solomon chapter eight, if you skip over to chapter eight, this is the love passage in the Bible when it comes to romantic love between a man and a woman. Verse six, the woman is talking, she says, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, watch this, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it out. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. Do you see what 
she's saying? She says, love is as strong as death. In the ancient Near East, people would compare their feelings to death to convey the intensity of them. We still do that today. We will still text, I'm dead. Like we still use it to, to convey our feelings. This is, we're just being biblical when we say that. But if you think about death, Death is irreversible, right? Like no one dies and changes their mind. It's irreversible. She says love is as strong as death. So when you stand on the altar one day and you say, I promise to love you until death do you part, you know what you're saying? You're saying, look, I know what love is. Love is a choice. Sometimes it's a feeling, but it is always a choice. I don't need to know what's going to happen between now and the day we die, but I do know that I am committed to loving you every single day because love is irreversible. And she says it's as jealous as the grave. Jealousy there, it's not talking about insecurity. It is talking about intense passion. It's the idea that love is passionately exclusive. It's as jealous as the grave. If you think about the grave, the grave doesn't share with anyone. Like no one gets put in the ground and then shared around. It's passionately exclusive. The love that I have with Kat is not to be shared with anyone else in the world. That's why websites like ashleymadison.com, it's an app that exists for married people to have an affair. The tagline for Ashley Madison is life is short have an affair. It is the opposite of love. The final question that I want to ask you is this, to hopefully save your marriage before it begins. Have you both experienced a greater love? Have you both experienced a greater love? See, the love between a man and a woman in the Song of Solomon, it's, it's ultimately to point to a love that is greater, the love of Jesus Christ that he has for his people the church, the bride of Christ. Do you know the love of God, that God, a perfect father, gave his son for you? In love, he gave his son for you, Jesus Christ, who wasn't as God. He left heaven on a pursuit, like a man should pursue a woman. He left heaven pursuing you in me, coming to earth. And he loved you enough that he would give his life for you. So when Jesus Christ hung on the cross, he was thinking about you in love. Have you ever thought that there is someone in this world that loved you so much that they actually died for you? And when he died on that cross, he took all of your sins upon himself. On the third day, he rose from the dead, conquering your sins. Why? So that you could be completely forgiven by God. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done. Do you believe that because God loves you so much, he can forgive anything you've done, no matter where you've been and what you've done? And Jesus Christ has come so that through faith in him, when you surrender your life to him, you know what happens? Is you enter into a real, enjoyable intimate relationship that will last for all of eternity. Jesus wants you for all of eternity. Do you know that greater love? I want to close tonight just by illustrating what I'm talking about tonight. So if I can just invite some friends on stage real quick. This is my friend Andrea, and I'm just going to ask her if she will just run in place. So if you'll just start running in place for a minute, or maybe for a few, but uh, yeah, you want to stretch it out, get loose, it's great, good. So here's what I want you to think about, okay? Andrea's running to symbolize running towards Jesus, and so she's fixing her attention forward, she knows Jesus, she loves Jesus, and she is running towards Jesus. This is where you want to be, this is what you want to be doing, okay? You want to smell like Jesus, you want to live fully surrendered to him, you want to fix your gaze on him and run towards him with all of your heart. And for some of you, this is just what you need to focus on right now. Like you need to not worry about finding the one. You need to just focus on being with Jesus and enjoying Jesus. But if you're in a good place to date, like, Andrea, here's the reality. Like, you've, you've got options. And so, hey, let me just say this. Uh, for the 
the guys in the room, like we can flip this as well. So this isn't just an illustration for the girls regarding guys, like you can flip it. Guys, you can imagine yourself surrounded by girls. Some of you are like, Lord, please make that so. <laughs> but Andrea, like you've got, you've got options, like you've got uh, this option back here. Andrea, why don't you go ahead and check it out? Now, don't take your eyes off Jesus, but uh, Andrea, what, no, don't look back, but what do you think? Like, hello, Andrea, I told you, stop, don't look at me, don't look at him. Look, here's the reality, like you, you have options, but there are, there are good options and then there are options that aren't the best. So you've got some people who are walking through life right now and they're just walking at a pace that you're not. It's not possible to run towards Jesus and keep your eyes on Jesus and look back at the same time. And so there's going to be some options in your life where they don't smell like Jesus. You get around them and you don't smell Jesus because they're not living surrendered to Jesus. Or you know what? Their understanding of sex isn't being shaped by the word of God, it's being shaped by culture. Or maybe they just don't have the right people in their life who are sharpening them and encouraging them. And so I'm just telling you that this guy isn't the best option. And then you got these options. So guys, you need to be running because if you're not running, she's going to leave you in the dust. But you got these different options. Now, I think about this option right here. And here's the thing, like he's, he's running at the same speed you are. Here's the difference. He's running in slightly a different direction than you are. And so this is where things can get problematic because you know what, you can look and be like, yeah, but you know what, we have so much fun together and he's a family guy and he's got a lot of integrity at his work and we're both highly ambitious and so we could be a power couple together because we're both crushing it at our work, we're both making a lot of money, you put that together and the double income, no kids, season of life will be glorious and and. We like the same foods, we like the same music, we got tickets to T-Swift today, and so we're gonna do that, and that's gonna be awesome. Here's the problem, is that he is, right now it looks like he's just heading in slightly different direction, but you play this out over decades, and those are two totally different trajectories. Andrea, my fear is that this is a scenario with a guy who has never experienced that greater love. What is most important to you, Jesus, isn't important to him. And if you're not careful, you'll spend your marriage praying for your spouse instead of praying with your spouse. And so then, Andrea, you've got, you've got guys that you look to your right or your left, hey, you don't need to find the one, you can just find one. And so let's just say you're out, like you can just find one. <laughs> and here's the thing, like this is, this is what you want. Like you want to just run towards Jesus and if you look to your right or your left and you see someone else running towards Jesus, you find someone that, that you get around him and he smells like Jesus. You spend time with him and it's clear that he has friends who are encouraging him. He has the right people in his life. It's clear that he has an understanding of what a spring-like relationship looks like. He has a vision for what love is. He's experienced that greater love. Then that can be a really good thing. But it isn't an ultimate thing. So here's the thing, Andrea, whether that's your reality, and that could be your reality, like this, this winter, maybe God brings you into a relationship, and if he does, praise God, that's a good thing. But whether that's your reality or this is your reality, the best thing you can do is run wholeheartedly towards Jesus. Because we don't run to find a spouse. We run to enjoy Jesus. Would you guys give Andrea a hand? I just want to ask you to close your eyes. And I just want to ask you to do business with the Lord right now. I don't know what he's doing in your heart. I don't know what he's saying to you. I don't know what he's pressing on you with. But I do want to say if you're here tonight 
and you're understanding what a greater love looks like for the first time, for the first time you're understanding the love that Jesus Christ has for you, and you wanna begin a relationship with him, then I just encourage you right in this moment to invite him in through faith. Just say, Lord Jesus, would you come into my life tonight? Would you forgive me of my sins? Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for me. Thank you that you rose from the dead for me. Would you come into my life? Would you forgive me of my sins? And would you begin to lead me in a new life? No matter where you're at, maybe God's calling you to get out of a relationship. Maybe God's just revealing an area of your life that doesn't smell like Him. My hope is that you'd just find His grace in this moment, that you would sense that He's speaking to you because He loves you. He's not mad at you, but He loves you deeply. And so would you just sit in that love tonight and would you meet with Him?